place, I'm going to need a runway. How long does it need to be? The plane needs to reach a speed of 45 meters per second to take off. So can I work out the shortest distance I need to make the runway? And with all this undergrowth, I don't want to have to clear any more than I have to. Would you believe it? Science line. Well, this problem, I just have to wait. What can I do for you? Stella, I want to know how fast I'm going on my bike. And I'd like to know how fast I can go on my skate. Because I'm sure I can go faster than him. Yeah, but the trouble is our speeds are changing all the time. So what's the easiest way to measure it? Well, you could just buy one of those bike computers. Can't afford it. And how would I fit one of those on my skates? Any ideas, Stella? OK, let me think about it. i better get my skates on for this one. I think we should look at exactly what speed is. Now, our speed tells us the distance we've travelled in a certain time. And the faster the speed, the more ground we cover each second. So, to be able to work out our speed, we need to know the distance we've travelled and the time taken to cover that distance. One for Femi to investigate. What I want to find out is how the police know someone's speeding. After all, they can't be sitting in their car with them, watching their speedometer. So how do they work the speed out? For this investigation, I'm off to see Tom Matheson, who's very interested in the speed of cars and lorries, particularly if they're breaking the limit. Tom, so why is it you're so interested in the speeds that cars travel? The most important one is the safety of road users, be they car drivers or pedestrians. The faster a vehicle is going, the more injury it's going to cause if it comes into a contact with a pedestrian, for example. But how can you tell if a car's speeding? Would you just guess? Oh, no, no, we don't guess. I, I have a, several uh, methods open to me. I have a speed gun, I have uh, fixed cameras at the side of the road, and we have a time and distance computer. To calculate the speed of a car, Tom needs two measurements. A distance the car has travelled and the time it took to cover that distance. Tom can use the computer to measure the distance between these markings on the road and the markings under the shadow of the bridge. And then all he has to do is time how long it takes a car to travel between the two marks. Dividing the distance by the time gives him the car's speed. OK, we're going to uh, measure the distance now, Femi, between the paint marks on the road and the shadow of the railway bridge. Okay. So if you start the uh, orange button there when we come to the marks and turn it off when we come to the shadow of the bridge. All right. So this computer is a bit like a measuring wheel, then? That's right. It's just measuring the distance. Here we are. Start it now. Start it. OK, get ready, and as soon as I tell you, turn it off. Turn it off now. OK. Here we are. And that distance is 105. Excellent. The police have found that this sort of distance, 0.105 of a mile, about a tenth of a mile, is long enough to give them an accurate indication of a car's average speed. Now all we have to do is park up and wait for a likely candidate. We've put in 105, which is the distance measurement, and now on this side we're going to use the stopwatch side of it and we're going to time the vehicles travelling between the white paint marks and the bridge. Black car on the outside lane. I don't think it's going that fast. Let's no, see. Nor do I. Here we go. To the shadow, that's it. Now, to get the speed, all I have to do is divide the distance by the time the car takes to cover it. Luckily, the computer does that for me. 49.93. Oh, you were lucky. <laughs> Just, Just within the limit by 0.7 of a mile an hour. You were lucky. Another way Tom can measure speed is by using roadside cameras which are triggered by cars going too fast and a double flash and the markings on the road are a clue to how they work. Each site has calibration marks laid on the road surface that are two metres apart. Now when a car comes along and triggers the camera and has a photograph taken, it automatically takes a second photograph half a second later. Now all we do is put our finger on the mark there where the back wheel is, move on to the second photograph and count how many squares 
the vehicle has travelled in that half second. Okay, so that's one, two, three, four, five. Now, they're two metres apart, is that's that right? right? So that means in half a second that car has travelled ten metres. That's correct. And then we look on the chart behind us and we see that uh, metres travelled 10 and half a second equates to 44.7 miles an hour. Now that's nearly 45 miles an hour and uh, we will send this motorist uh, a notice of intended prosecution. This man means business. I think I'll walk from now on. So using distance and time measurements, I can easily work out how fast I'm going on my skates. Now, I've marked out a distance of 10 metres between these markers. Once up to speed, I'm going to time how long I take to cover it. Now, I'll use this ramp to get me going. Here goes. What speed is this? Ten metres in five seconds. Seen from above, I can see the distance covered each second. And if it's the same distance each time, then over the whole run I was travelling at a constant speed. Each two metres was covered in the same time of one second. So my constant speed was two metres per second. Let's see if I can improve on that. Not bad. 10 metres in three seconds, or three and a third metres every second. So my constant speed was three and a third metres per second. Now watch this. I'm now starting at the top of the ramp, so... Even faster. Only two seconds to cover 10 metres, or five metres each second. That means my constant speed that time was five metres per second. If we look at all three of my speeds from above, it looks like I'm overtaking myself. There are other ways of looking at constant speed, as Femi's about to find out. Believe it or not, speed, distance and time helped make these stunts possible. Now I've come to this film set to meet stunt woman Elaine Ford, is going to help me investigate why knowing about constant speed is so important when filming explosive action scenes. And I mean explosive. This is the getaway car that I'll be driving and the shot opens with me screeching into view. I'm then going to drive up very fast behind this vehicle here with the camera on it and then I'm going to pull alongside it so the camera can see into my car right. and then I'm going to drive through that barricade over there where I'll screech to a halt and there'll be an explosion going off. Fine. So, <laughs> how important is speed and all that? It's really important for me. I'll tell you why, because first of all, I need to know how long the director wants me to take to catch up the camera car, okay? I then need to know how fast the camera car is going so that I can maintain a constant speed alongside it so the camera can actually see into my car. Then I need to know how long the director wants me to drive before I crash through the boxes. And really, because speed, time and distance are all linked, I've then got to work out how long the road needs to be so we can get everything done. Got a lot of working out to do. Have. <laughs> <laughs> I know that the camera vehicle here is going to be doing a constant speed of 50 kilometres an hour, OK? And that's at 14 metres per second. Um, I will actually be going faster. I'll be, go I'll be doing 20 metres per second because the director wants me to catch up the vehicle and pull alongside it before going through the barricade. So we know the constant speeds of both vehicles, but how are we going to work out from that where the cars meet? I can actually work out how far the camera car has travelled by plotting it out on this graph, OK? So we know that the camera car is doing 14 metres per second. So if we say after one second it's done 14, after two, 28 metres, after three, 42, and so on, OK? And then if we look at this graph here, we can see that we've got a nice straight line. Now, because I'm going to be going a lot faster, I'll be doing 20 metres per second, OK? You can see here that my line is a lot steeper and, of course, the two lines don't cross. So, on a time-distance graph, something with a constant speed produces a straight line and the higher the constant speed, the steeper the line is. Elaine and the director have worked out that she will catch up with the camera car after 10 seconds. The camera truck will be travelling at a constant speed of 14 metres per second. That's 14 metres 
every second. And if the camera car is travelling at a constant speed of 14 metres per second, then in 10 seconds it will have covered 140 metres. If we actually put a marker, for instance, 140 metres past the first cones and both cars reach it at the same time, we know we're doing okay. Right. Now, this is 114 metres, so this is where Elaine should catch up with the camera truck. But the director wants me to do another 10 seconds so he can get a side view of the car before it hits the barricade. So that means 10 times 14, that's another 140 metres. Time for a test run. Now she should catch up with the camera truck at the cones. Ah, now she's caught up, overtaken and um, just kept on going. But again, find out what's going on. Elaine, you came from behind the truck and then you overtook the truck and kept on going. Well, I didn't actually change my speed, so I was going faster than the camera truck, which is why I overtook them. You see, when you overtake somebody, you're not actually doing the same speed as them. So what I need to do is, once I'm alongside the camera truck, mm -hmm. I need to then reduce my speed to the same speed as the camera truck to make it work. But it's time now to put in the other props and the explosives. It looks like my measurements have worked, so it's time now for me to sit back and enjoy the fun. Oh, no. Now, to make this more realistic, I think you should play the part of my partner in crime. Thanks. Come on, let's strap yourself in. Thank you so much. I don't think I like this investigation anymore. And my role was to grab the secret documents from Mr Biggs' henchman. I've rigged this trolley on rails to make it easier to pull the crates I've unloaded from the plane into the cave. And this forsometer measures the pulling force involved. Here goes. I'm winding with a force of 200 newtons. The crate isn't moving because friction is pushing against the trolley with a force of 200 newtons. The forces acting on it in opposite directions are equal. Now I'm going to increase the force. Once the force I'm using is greater than the push of friction against the trolley, it starts to move. Now look what happens to the speed of the trolley if I keep applying the same force now that it's moving and continue to pull it. Oh. Shall we watch that again in slow motion? Once the crate is moving, by pulling with the same force all the time, the crate increases the distance it travels each second. So by pulling the crate with the same force all the time, its speed is increasing. It's moving faster and faster. Another way of saying this is that it's accelerating. Now some people do this for pleasure. I think I'll leave Femi to investigate. scenes at the Horse of the Year show. Now with all this horsepower around it seems like the ideal place to conduct my investigation into how much force is needed to get something started and just importantly how much force is needed to stop it. Now the only trouble is these horses aren't doing much talking. What I really need is a big strong person to tell me how much force they're using to get something moving. Perhaps I can be of help. Jamie Reeves, the world's strongest man. Very handy. pulling large weights around. Yes, in the World's Strongest Man competition and the Strongman competitions we can pull barges, buses, big fire engines, ships. 
even aeroplanes. Excellent. Well, I've got a dinky little carriage for you out there to fall. You don't mind, do you? No, not at all. Excellent. But how am I going to measure the kind of force you're exerting to get the carriage going? Well, I've got a force meter here. So we can attach this onto my harness and attach it onto the truck and we'll be able to measure the force. Excellent. Um, let's get your harness up then. OK. This is an old-fashioned horse-drawn dray and it's still used to deliver beer in London. It has a mass of 1,500 kilograms and normally takes two strapping shire horses to pull it around. But today, it's just going to be Jamie. Ready, Jamie? Go! Now, if I convert the reading on the forceometer into metric units, I can see that Jamie needed a force of four and a half kilonewtons. That's four and a half thousand newtons to start the carriage moving, but he doesn't seem to need as much to keep it moving. Stop! But how much force would he need to stop it? Jamie, awesome or what? Amazing. Now you obviously had to exert an awful lot of force to get the carriage started. It's always difficult starting something like this because you have to overcome friction and unbalance the forces, but once it's actually moving, it's just a constant force to keep it moving. So to get the dray to move, Jamie had to unbalance the forces acting on it. As it starts to move, it's accelerating, or rather being accelerated by Jamie pulling with the force greater than friction. But once the carriage was moving, it became a lot easier because all he had to do to keep a constant speed was to balance the forces acting on the dray. But to slow down and stop the carriage, once again required unbalanced forces. OK, um, well, I've got a slightly heavier carriage for you to pull now. Oh, great. This lorry has a mass of 6,000 kilograms, four times heavier than the dray, so I guess it'll take more force to start it. And she did need a larger force to start it, a whopping 26,400 newtons. But he still needs less force to keep it moving. But to stop it, he would also need a really large force. Thank goodness for air brakes. Jamie, that looked exhausting. You had to exert so much more force just to get the lorry to accelerate. Yeah, I needed to use a lot of force to overcome the friction at the start. So it takes a lot of force to get something moving. But once it's started, it's easier to keep it going. Time to put what I've learnt into action. OK, Femi, home as quick as you can. There might be some time, Jamie. Something tells me that this might be slightly unbalanced. Before I go, watch this. Kurt here is on a track running on an airbed, so there's very little friction. How would you describe his motion if this happens? Well, the force of gravity is pulling on the weight, and that force stays the same. So, so Kurt is a constant force pulling on him. So he's like the crate was. A constant force is acting on him, so he's accelerating. He's speeding off, but then the force stops. And because he's on an airbed, there's very little friction. So the forces are now balanced. So that must mean he keeps going up the same speed. So what happens when he fell off at the end? 